Daniel Ellsberg, the man who leaked the Pentagon Papers, died today at the age of 92. The most famous whistleblower in American history is also one of the very few to expose high-level wrongdoing without spending any time in, in prison. Ellsberg leaked the 7,000-page top-secret history of the Vietnam War to the New York Times in 1971. His goal was to shorten American military involvement by showing the public the government was systematically lying about the war. Joining me now, presidential historian and co-author of the Nixon tapes, Doug Brinkley, and on the phone, columnist for Foreign Policy magazine, Michael Hirsch. Michael just did an interview with Daniel Ellsberg just the other day, his final one. Um, first, so, Doug, let's talk about the, the legacy of Daniel Ellsberg. What did it mean for him to leak the Pentagon Papers in 1971? I'm sorry to um, hear of his death. Uh, he's a major figure, as you rightfully said, probably the most renowned um, whistleblower in U.S. history. Uh, when he released in 71 with 7,000 classified pages that uh, really documented particularly uh, the malfeasance of the Lyndon Johnson administration, all of the lies and distortions that LBJ and McNamara had made about Vietnam were in those papers. Nixon got furious that, about this leak, and uh, it led to the famous uh, First Amendment fight of the New York Times versus the White House. Uh, but it was really damning on Lyndon Johnson, and Nick, Nixon, of course, overreacted to it, and Ellsberg became a fugitive from justice, and um, it, it's, it's one of the epic stories of the um, of the Vietnam War era, the Ellsberg Pentagon Papers, and then the reaction of, of the Nixon thugs breaking into Ellsberg's uh, psychiatrist office. It's part of what precipitated Watergate, one of the steps before Watergate. I think it's the step that's kind of led to Watergate. Uh, you know, when I, I've interviewed Ellsberg quite a bit, and the one thing that always uh, he kept saying what made him do this. And, you know, he was a Rand uh, guy, a brilliant defense analyst. He kept saying over and over again uh, that they were, well, that the quote was that they're eating at our uh, children. They're, they were just eating our own in Vietnam. And he had talked particularly to the Beat Generation poet, uh, Gary Snyder, um, and, and who was very anti-war, and Ellsberg would listen to dissent, but he kind of didn't know what to do. He, he had really seen that the, the lies had started in 67, and he didn't come forward till 71, but boy, when he did, it was an, a big deal. Nobody could find him. The FBI wanted him. Only Walter Cronkite of CBS News tracked him down. They made a secret rendezvous at a—Cronkite uh, uh, subjected himself to being blindfolded in Cambridge, Massachusetts and thrown in the back of a car and driven to an obscure basement where there were the Pentagon Papers wrapped in, um, in newspaper and brown, you know, um, protective wrapping. And Cronkite was able to do what the FBI couldn't do, find Ellsberg and talk to him. And that aired on CBS and, and the Nixon White House seethed that big media via Walter Cronkite uh, didn't turn in the fugitive, instead gave him time on the nightly news. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't you also write, though, that despite him finding Ellsberg and this getting this big get, there wasn't really any news made by Cronkite in that interview? So you're you're right. There really wasn't Ellsberg. any news. Yeah, good point. Uh, and you know what? He didn't. That's uh, an excellent point. Cronkite went to all that to get to Ellsberg, but he didn't ask any hardball questions. <laughs> he kind of just let Ellsberg talk. And so there was a, of course, certainly um, the Nixon White House was angry at Cronkite, but many people said, why was Cronkite doing softball questions to Daniel Ellsberg? Very, very good memory. You I, well, I remember it when I was writing my book and I had a little chapter about Walter Cronkite. Um, Michael, I want to talk to you about your last interview uh, with Daniel Ellsberg. You, you focused a lot on, on whistleblowing and the difference between whistleblowing and leaking and just how dangerous it's become to, to try and straddle that line. What did he tell you? Well, uh, he said a couple of interesting things. One, uh, that no one should, uh, who wants to whistleblow, should be out there thinking they're going to emulate his case because he said it was nearly a miracle 
that he got off the way he did. And it was just because of Watergate, because the judge ruled uh, that uh, what the Watergate plumbers had done in trying to break into the psychiatrist's office uh, had essentially rendered uh, the trial uh, and the 12 counts that he was uh, facing on the Espionage Act uh, moot. So he, he got off because of that. And what he emphasized was that it's become more difficult, more dangerous uh, than ever to whistleblow these days. Uh, because the Espionage Act, which was first used in his case to try to convict him, has now been used uh, a number of times, uh, in fact, mainly by uh, Barack Obama's administration. So you've had uh, a number of uh, prominent whistleblowers who have actually been convicted and sent to prison, uh, which, which is quite unusual. So it's, it's, what his message was is that it's more necessary than ever. Uh, to uncover state secrets, but it's more dangerous than ever. And he knew what he was doing. He knew the risks that he was taking. Right, Michael? He did. Uh, I mean, he told me, and this was uh, in what his family said was his last interview in May, that he uh, really believed he was going to spend the rest of his life in prison, uh, facing 12 felony counts. And uh, he could have done so uh, had it not been for the sort of, uh, you know, oddity of Watergate. And, and he felt throughout his life, Doug, um, that the government wasn't being truthful with the American public, not just for the, through the Pentagon Papers, not just what happened at the Vietnam War, that Democrats and Republicans alike were, were in favor of whatever would help them domestically, and, and that sometimes did include wars. Absolutely. He was uh, just really denounced America's uh, interventions around the globe. He became a uh, dissident, a critic of U.S. foreign policy in Iraq and Afghanistan in recent years. Uh, Julian Assange, he thought, was a folk hero and uh, should be honored for having the courage to do what he did. Uh, Ellsberg became a darling of the hard left, of the Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, um, you know, um, cabal. Um, he was always a, a little bit, uh, you know, seemed to me to be a, a a, a little shaky and nervous. He had gone through a life of a lot of stress, uh, and it, he felt it was his moral obligation to speak truth to power. And in later years, he would collaborate or talk to journalists and scholars trying to make sure they understood what was at stake. And don't, don't we should not underestimate on his death the power that in the in the courage of the New York Times under Abe Rosenthal to go forward and print the Pentagon Papers like they did and the Washington Post did uh, was a, a still a landmark moment in First Amendment history in the United States and it's Ellsberg that spurred all of that. It's a case law on prior restraint. Um, Doug Brinkley, Michael Hirsch, thank you very much.